about 2009, singer, Christian singer-songwriter Andrew Peterson wrote a book called The Beginning of a Series called The Wing Feather Saga. And over the next four or five years, he, he finished the saga, and it was four books total. The books did okay, um, but they really exploded in popularity during the pandemic because the author, who hadn't revisited his books for a while during the pandemic when he was stuck at home, got on Facebook Live every single night and read live for about 30 minutes from his, from his books. And he spent, I don't know how long it took him, but he read through all four books, about 1,000 pages, and every night he'd have 20, 25,000 people listening to him live read these books. About, a, I don't know, I guess six or seven, eight months ago, um, Charlotte and the kids found out about him, and they, they read them aloud together. Um, and then they said, hey, you got to read this too. And so I have audio booked the first three, and I'm reading the last one right now. They were intended for kids, but man, they're, they're awesome. They're awesome, and adults love them too. How many of you have read the, the Wingfoot Saga? Has anybody got anybody in here besides my family? Any of college? Nobody. Okay, great. You should. I'm telling you. And here's, think Chronicles of Narnia for the 21st century. It's about these this battle between good and evil, and it's an epic adventure story, an epic travel adventure story, good versus evil, and it's these ordinary people called to do extraordinary things by God, and the battle they have every day against the forces of evil and, and trusting God through all of that, just an incredible book series, but what's incredible about it is these ordinary people who are called to do extraordinary things. Which reminds me a whole lot of the story of Scripture, and especially the story of the Old Testament, where over and over and over again, you find these stories of ordinary people. It's this epic battle between good and evil, and yet ordinary people are trying to figure out how to live through that and to do what's right, even in their struggles with faith. You see, as we open up the pages of the Old Testament, it's, it's a story of real people, and aren't you glad, regardless of how wealthy they are, I mean, there are wealthy landowners, but there are poor immigrants. I mean, there's all sorts of different types of people described in Scripture. And regardless of where they come from, they're just regular people, and you easily see their flaws, and they're just trying to make it, and they're trying to survive. And I love that Scripture points us to these very ordinary people. As I look around the room, I don't see a whole lot of like super extraordinary people. There's a whole lot of ordinary people in here, right? Just ordinary, regular people, real people just trying to make it, trying to do what's right, trying to survive. And it's fun to think that God has called us to extraordinary things. You may feel like your life is really ordinary and that surely God hasn't called you to do anything extraordinary. Listen, if we are in an epic battle of good versus evil and we are called to rescue people from the domain of Satan's darkness, that means you're called to extraordinary things, regardless of how ordinary you might feel. One of my favorite examples of an ordinary person doing something extraordinary is, I'll give you in just a second, but here's what Paul says about this. 1 Corinthians 1, listen to this. For considering your, consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. See, you are pretty ordinary, he says. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. As I look around the room, I see a group of people who aren't boasting in themselves. We're just real, regular, ordinary people trying our best. And if God is going to do something extraordinary through us, it's only, be gonna, it's only going to be by his power, not our own. It's the story of scripture and it's the story of the church today. It's just real people. I don't know if I remember it. I remember Spud Webb, but in 1986, Spud Webb, five foot seven, Spud Webb won the NBA dunk contest. He beat his teammate, Dominique Wilkins, who was pretty incredible himself. And short people across the world felt some pride in that moment, right? <laughs> if a five foot seven guy can win the NBA slam dunk contest, then man, there's hope for all of us. There's something special about a regular guy doing something extraordinary, and that's the story of Scripture. It's real people 
with real faith. Boy, there's some flawed people in Scripture, no doubt, and we'll talk about that in, in a second. But isn't it amazing that as we follow the story of Scripture through the whole thing, we get to see not just regular people, but we get to see their real faith in spite of difficulties. You might describe faith as trust in the promises of God regardless of the circumstances. And isn't that what you find in the story of Scripture? Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 for a minute. The New Testament describes these amazing characters of the Old Testament and their incredible faith, their real faith through difficulty. We're going to start in verse 8. We're going to kind of skip through some verses here. Look at verse 8. Abraham, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You skip to verse 11 and it's Sarah. So faith, so by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. I think there's a description there of, of real people. These are ordinary people. I mean, they're too old to have kids. They're kind of wa old and washed up. And God uses them through their faith to start his nation. And story after story are, in the Old Testament are like that. Look at, skip to verse 20. It's Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Or you could skip down to verse 24, and it's Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And then just a portion of what we read a second ago, 32 and 33. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. See, so you find a bunch of regular old people that God uses for extraordinary purposes because of their real faith. As I look around the room right now, I see people who live up to what we've just described faith as, trust in the promises of God regardless of the circumstances. Think about all the, the trials that are represented in this room right now, and many of we don't know about. We don't, we don't all know each other really well, and there's some, there's some stuff that's going on or that has gone on in people's lives that a lot of folks don't know about. There's a lot of faith, real, gritty faith represented in this room. I'm thankful that as I look around, I don't have to depend just on my own. I can look around and see faith modeled by the people in this room right now. But here's the deal. We just read from Hebrews chapter 11, right? All these examples of faith you read about. But here's the good news. Those aren't just faraway people. Those, those are our people. You go back to chapter 10, verse 30, last verse of chapter 10, before it leads into chapter 11. And here's what it says. This is so neat. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. So you think back of people, you think about people who, who struggle with their faith, who are fearful, who are scared. And the Hebrews writer says, that's not us. And he would say today, if you see people who are fearful and lack faith and who lack trust, that's not your people. And he continues with this, but of those, we are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You see this real faith described in Hebrews chapter 11 and we see throughout the story of the Old Testament, that's just not, that's not just their story. That's our story. We are of them. Those are our people. We model our faith off of theirs and I'm thankful that I look around right now and I see real people, real faith, but let's be real honest. As you read the story of scripture, there's real people and real faith, but there's a lot of real problems in there. A lot of real problems in the stories that we read. I think sometimes we have this idea that if, if you have real faith, at least we're kind of, this is thrown at us in, in our Western culture. If you have real faith, then your problems are going to be minimized. Oh, you might have a few, but you're just going to be overflowing with blessings. You're not going to have any, you're not going to have any trials. And most of us recognize that's, 
That's not true at all. And proof of that is what you read in the Old Testament, the story of Scripture, right? We've got this perfect book. We believe that this is God's perfect revelation, and yet it is full of imper- stories about imperfect people. But I think we could take it a step further. These aren't just imperfect people. Many of the families in the Old Testament are a hot mess. I mean, it's tough stuff. Let me give you a couple of examples. The very first couple rebelliously disobey God. Their firstborn murders his brother. Noah gets drunk. His son sees him naked, and then he curses his son. Sarah, as she struggles with infertility, decides, you know what? I'm just going to give my husband a concubine. And when that concubine has a child... Then she abuses, Sarah abuses this concubine. What's Abraham do? He just sits back because he's got two women. He doesn't do anything. He's passive about the whole thing. And then you get to to Isaac and Rebekah, and it's just more drama. And they have twin boys, and they show a whole bunch of partiality to them. And there's Lot, whose two daughters seduce him into incest, drunken incest. And you've got this massive sibling rivalry. You know what I've just described? the first 25 pages of the Bible. That we're not, I mean, we're just a, just a tiny fraction of our way through the Scripture, and it's an absolute mess. Why in the world would God give his perfect revelation to us and tell us about all these really messy people? Maybe it's to remind us that God specializes in redeeming messes. Maybe this is a reminder that If you struggle, if you have sin problems in your family, there's only one way to fix that. And that's through God's work. And as we've said today, it's in the Lord's Supper, it's only through Jesus that we have this forgiveness. God, I mean, that's what this whole story is about from beginning to end. God working through his people to redeem them from the mess that they've made. Boy, we need that reminder. Because if we're honest, we look around the room and we just look into ourselves and we say, man, sometimes I feel like a real mess. The good news of the gospel is God specializes in redeeming and fixing the messes that we made. But this is not just about sin. When you read the story of the Old Testament, it's real human suffering and disappointment and discouragement and infertility, and loneliness, and sadness. Real problems, just like we have today. I was, I wrote this sermon. Some of you may think I just get up here and make stuff up when I'm up here. I actually typed some, a lot of this into my computers. I told my brother that this morning. He's like, what? You ty-? Like, he didn't even know. It's like, really? You just think, I, he's just like, you just get up there. Give me a break, right? So I, I, when was it? Tuesday morning. I couldn't sleep for a variety of reasons. Dogs would be one of those reasons. Um, but when I, it was about three in the morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep because my mind started going on all that I got to do the next couple of weeks. I was thinking about my to-do list, and I could not go to sleep. So I got up, and I worked on this sermon. And I worked on and I wrote this part about real people with real problems and I thought you know what I bet I'm not the only person awake right now I bet there's some other folks maybe some students who just stayed up that late because for whatever reason you did that but a lot of us we just couldn't couldn't sleep so we're thinking about wrestling with my and mine was just minor mine's just a little bit of a to- to-do list that I was stressing about and it reminded me that even David himself writes about sleeplessness in the Psalms see the story of the Old Testament is a story about real people with real faith, and their faith doesn't eliminate their problems. They got real problems. I grew up about 50, 50, 75 feet away from the Buffalo Creek in the hills of West Virginia. This is about 10 miles downstream. We didn't have a covered bridge right next to our house. But about 10 miles, so you can see this, the creek. It's called Buffalo Creek, small creek. Where we lived, it was muddy. You didn't play in it. It was kind of gross. Um, but I could have, had I wanted gotten in a boat, and on that boat, 
traveled down the Buffalo Creek, gotten on the Monong Monongahela River, and then gone to the Ohio River where it connects in Pittsburgh, gone all the way down the Ohio River to Paducah, hopped on the Tennessee River, and ended up right down here at Hagee's Catfish Restaurant. 700 miles by car from where I'm from, I could have traveled by water right here. Isn't that amazing? Isn't the Mississippi River Basin amazing? 59% of the, the nation's streams are a part of the Mississippi River Basin. And get this, 7,000 streams and rivers form this basin. It's huge. 7,000 streams come together to form one mighty river. Which to me is a reminder of the story of Scripture. Where you've got hundreds of stories of real people with real faith and real problems. And those stories of the Old Testament all come together like a mighty, like the tributaries of a mighty river to form a story that ultimately points to Jesus. Oh, those stories are diverse. They don't all match up and there's parallel stories going on in different places, but all of them come together like a mighty river to tell us about our Savior. You see, the main character of the Old Testament is not Moses or David or Abraham. The main character of the Old Testament is God and ultimately who he is pointing to, his son, Jesus Christ. You don't believe me? Here's what Genesis 12 says. When God gives his promise to Abram, here's what he says. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I'll show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and listen to this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What he, what's he pointing to? The rest of the story of the Old Testament will be the story of Abraham's descendants. And God says the point of that whole story is to get to the one who will bless every family on the earth. Whole thing's about Jesus. Whole thing's pointing to Jesus. Here's what Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26. Moses didn't think anything about Jesus, right? Hebrews says otherwise. He considered the his suffering in Egypt, he says he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Even for Moses, it was about Jesus. And then you get to the New Testament, and the way they describe the Old Testament, listen to this. Philip finds Nathaniel, and here's what he says to him. We have found him of whom Moses, in the law and also the prophets, wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Everything that we've been reading about our entire lives from the law and prophets of God, we found the answer in him, in Jesus. The whole story is about Jesus. And so I'm excited this year to finally announce, we waited on you students, to finally announce our theme for this year. And it's this, real people, real faith, real problems, finding Jesus in the stories, or in the story of the Old Testament. And each week what we're going to do is we're going to highlight a different character in chronological order. We're going to walk through the story of the Old Testament, and we're going to go character by character. And boy, you read these characters, it's like you're reading from a soap opera in the 21st century. I mean, there's some really crazy stuff going on, stuff that's relevant even today. And so we'll, we'll talk about all that stuff and how it transforms us and helps us to be better people today, but I want every week for us to see not just how it can help our lives, but how it ultimately points to Jesus. And so we'll start next week with Adam and Eve, right? So we'll start from the very beginning. Here's a list of all the people we'll go through this year. Ladies, I want you to know I included all of them I could in there. So there's going to be a whole bunch of sermons about some of the women in the Old Testament. So I'm excited about this. But here's, here's where we're going. Now you'll notice that's not 52 sermons or however many year, or weeks we have left this year. Um, we'll do like I always do four mini-series throughout the year. I'm excited about this first one, my culture, my Bible, and me, how to navigate faithfully and sensitively. Like, how do we deal with our culture in faithful ways? Every summer, we do a series on the family. In the fall, we'll have a series on what it looks like to discern, be discerning without being pharisaical and judgmental. And then I know I've advertised, I've talked about this one for a year or so now, but we're finally going to do this one this fall, what the Bible actually says about gender. So I am so, so excited about this series and every week, we'll just walk through the story of the Old Testament. We'll talk about real people who, in spite of their real problems, demonstrate incredibly real faith. Now, you might say, well, Matt, why don't you just do those cool little series all the time? I used to, over the past seven years, 
since 2016, we've walked through Mark, Ephesians, Psalms, two years in Luke, two years in Acts. And you say, that's great, Matt, but why don't you just do like those single sermons like you did last Sunday? Man, I, I, I like those. Let me tell you why I, I walk through the passages of Scripture and why it's a conviction for me. We want to be a Bible-based church. Preaching through books of the Bible and preaching through the story of Scripture better equips us to be one. It is easier to preach sermons on single verses. It's easier to do some of these topical, topical series. And they're, and they're fun and they're helpful and, and people are drawn to them. I get more compliments about them. But it's harder to walk through Scripture. And so if we want to be a Bible-based church, we walk through Scripture because the Bible sets the agenda. Not, not what I'm feeling, not what I think you need, not you and what you think we need, not culture, not relevance. I'm like, God set the agenda. Now this year will be a little bit different as we jump from character to character to character. But still, there, you know what? There's some characters on the list of characters that I'd prefer to skip. Right, there's some tough stuff in the Old Testament that I'd prefer to skip, but I'm going to let God set the agenda here. And it forces the, us to, to then address topics that we might be tempted to avoid. There's going to be some tough stuff that I'd rather say, you know what? Let's talk about something else. But preaching through Scripture forces me to engage this, these stories. And so the story of Scripture, walking through Scripture, becomes the center of my preaching and our preaching here at Stantonville. Not what we think we want or we think we need or some cute sermon calendar that I've come up with. This is about walking through Scripture and let God set the agenda. And for me, that's a conviction. I'm, I'm going to do that. I have to do that or I don't feel right about what we're doing. So that's why we do this. Let's, let's wrap this up. What do we get out of this? Like, this is just the intro. Man, we'll jump into Adam and Eve next week. And boy, there's a, lot to, there's a lot to talk about there. What do we do with this today? What are we going to get from this whole series? Let me tell you two things I think we'll get. Number one. I think this whole series will remind us every week that we desperately need Jesus and only he can fix our broken stories. Man, you got all of these broken stories throughout the whole story. Every week we're going to be reminded vividly that we can't fix this. You may think about your life right now and think, man, Matt, you don't know the problems I've got. It's easy for you to put a nice little statement on, this, on the screen, but you, you don't know what's going on. I, I get that. You know, the disciples say to Jesus one time after he's like, it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. They're like, well, then what? Who can make it then? Who can get into heaven if rich people can't get in? And Jesus responds with this statement. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's the story of the gospel. It doesn't matter how broken your life is. It may be really, really, really broken. But with God, all things are possible. But here's the second thing I want you to walk away with today as we begin this whole series. As real people with genuine problems that then model genuine faith, we help others find Jesus through our stories. See, the purpose of this whole series is to show how the Old Testament, all these stories ultimately point to Jesus. Listen, your story can point to Jesus if you're willing to let it. So here's how you do that. Here's the question I want you to ask. How are you going to use your story to help others find Jesus? Did you walk out of here today? I hope this is the question you're asking. How can you use your story to help other people find Jesus? And you say, I don't know, Matt. I don't have much of a story. Here's how you do this. Just two suggestions, two real quick. And the reason I give you these suggestions is because if you're, if you're looking for somebody, if you're just looking to, to walk up to somebody and say, hey, will you sit down and study the Bible with me? How's that gone for you lately? There are rare cases where people will do that. But people in general in our culture just aren't willing. To, here's where you start. You start with, with your story. And so you start by saying, by listening to their story. So you want to you do a good job of connecting with people and using your story to point them to Jesus. Listen to their story. Have them tell you where they've, and that's just, a, that's a relationship, right? You have a real conversation or a real relationship with somebody. Eventually you hear their story. And when you can make connections, you respond by telling the story of how God has changed your life. And maybe when they see what God has done in your life, that's when you can then say, hey, let's go to Scripture and let's study the Bible together. Because you started by listening to their story and you're using your story to point them to Jesus. <laughs> Yesterday I met a guy in, in Dallas, Texas, who is from about 30 miles up the road from where I grew up. It was pretty cool to be that far away from home and run into a guy from, from way back from where we were, were grew up, and he grew up pretty close to where, where I grew up. And 
so we were swapping stories, and I said, so did you go to, did, which church did you go to? And he said, well, I didn't go to church growing up. He said, I met my wife in the military, and she brought me to Jesus, and here we are at a, a men's conference years later. I didn't get to hear the rest of the story, how that happened, what that looked like, but here's what I'm guessing happened. I'm guessing his wife modeled genuine faith, and it pointed him to Jesus. Because of that, he became a follower of Jesus and is still a follower of Jesus to this day. How many people in this room right now are here because someone modeled faith? They were real. They had real problems. They weren't perfect, but they modeled faith to you, and it changed your life. There are countless people in this room, your grandparents or your parents, maybe that's what happened to them. But people come to Jesus because real people with real faith live out their faith in genuine ways. And it points people to Jesus. So I just ask you today, how are you going to use your story to point people to Jesus? If we can help you to know this Jesus that all of Scripture points to, we'd love to do that while we stand and sing together. There is beyond the azure blue.